I got off the road about two years ago. Live here in Sydney with my wife and son, and I work for this company, JPJ, which is it's a it's an Australian sound company. It's owned by an American sound company that I've worked for for thirty years. Um, I started in nine, I did my first tour in 1981, and how I got my start was I lived in Manhattan. And I lived down the street from a nightclub, and I noticed a lot of commotion going on one day. And I was just curious what was going on. And they were doing what you guys call the bump in, which we call a load in in America. I walked by, and this guy said, You want to be a loader? So I started as carrying equipment. Then I was offered to run a spotlight. And as I was working in the shows, I started to notice things going on on stage. And I became interested in sound. And through working there, I had an opportunity to go on a tour with an old punk rocker named Iggy Pop. I don't know if you guys ever heard of him. Um, now I had zero sound experience, but I managed to get the job anyway. Went on tour. Now back then, well, on this particular, we didn't travel with equipment, so every day was a different sound system. That was like my college. There were no schools like this back then. So every day I had a different sound system, I had to make it work for the show that night. And that was how I learned. And through that tour, which lasted maybe two years, maybe, I got a job with this company, which is owns the Australia company. And I've been on tour ever since, about 30 years. So why don't we start? Audio engineering is is, is sort of like a three-phase thing, in my opinion. It's either reproducing music for people to listen to in a live environment, or reproducing music for people to listen to as a recording. They both sort of involve the same theories, which is you're taking a microphone or a direct box, whatever, reproducing a sound, and using your imagination of whether you're going to reproduce it exactly the way that you hear it, or like some albums or recordings that you hear, they've taken a sound and then completely changed it so the recorded version or the amplified version is not what the original acoustic sound is. And the way we do that is we have to sort of have an idea of the acoustic version of that sound that we're trying to reproduce before we put a microphone and do anything. For example, like my voice, or a drum, or some, you know, box, you ever hear like a, you ever see those wood boxes that they use for percussion? Any type of instrument, you've got to sort of have a vision of what you're going to do with it, and that sort of dictates how you're going to amplify it or record it. Now, there are certain theories, you know, one of the questions that I've been asked is, how is the, how has the sound industry changed in the 30 years? Well, when I started, there, there were no digital consoles. Most sound systems that you use nowadays have processing units where all the, all the EQ and the compression is done internally in a box and you don't really see it. When I started, they, it was none of that. You had Basically, you had a crossover, and you had a, you know, a sub box. Let's say you had a three-way sound system. You had a bass speakers, mid speakers, and horns. And they each had their own amplifier channel. And then you had a crossover. And you guys know what a crossover is? Basically, what a crossover does is it, when you're using like a, a bi-amp to be lows and highs, a three-way would be lows, mids, and highs, four-way, you know, lows, mids, highs, super highs. And what the, what the crossover does is it decides at what frequency is the bass gonna stop sending the signal to the bass and start sending it to the mid range. And then at what frequency is it gonna start sending it to the highs. And when I studied, you had to decide those things. So the first thing you would do when you set up a sound system is you would turn up the lows feed until you heard the 
bass speakers work. Then you turn up the mids, and then you turn up the highs. And you would basically try to make it sound like now when you turn on a sound system like you work in a nightclub, you turn it on, it's, it's all pretty much done for you at the factory. So what's, the, the sound systems are better now, but what's kind of been lost a little bit is how does the sound system get set up from, from the beginning? And one of the other questions I was asked was, uh, what are some of the tools that I use? Well, for me, the only tool that I use is my ears. I don't, I don't use, like a, one program that's used widely in big venues is a program called Smart. You guys ever heard of Smart? Okay, that's, you guys know what that is? Smart is like an, it's an analyzing program. You use it to look on a screen of what the sound is doing as a graph. Now, you see a lot of people that set up PAs these days they're only focused on what it looks like instead of what they're hearing. So what I like to do and what we used to do back before we had those is you take whatever microphone the singer is going to be singing into. In my case, and I think it's still the same today, the, the industry sound is an SM58. I heard you talking about that. And the main objective is you want to make the PA sound like a natural, like one of these speakers, but only in a, in a bigger sense, in a, you know, so it's not too much lows, it's not too much highs, it sounds even. Then the next thing that I like to do is, everyone has a particular piece of music that they know what it sounds like. It really doesn't matter what that music is, but it has to be something that's your reference point that you know what it sounds like through any given speaker. And then when you play that through a PA system or even in a recording studio, let's say you're in, it goes the same for a recording engineer. If you're going into a new studio and you wanna make sure that your mixes come out and translate to every other speaker that people are gonna play it on, you have to understand what that studio sounds like, this particular, any control room so that your mixes don't turn out to be too bassy or too bright or not bright enough. And having that reference point, which for me is my voice through a microphone and a particular song that I might like to hear, that's how I, what I call tune my sound systems. Whether, um, if I'm going into a studio, I wanna make sure that I understand exactly what the frequency range of that particular room is and if I'm in a football stadium, I want to understand what the frequency range of that particular room might be. So that when I start mixing, if I, say for example, if I find that um, I, I start using a PA system that I didn't have time to really set up properly, and I notice that I'm doing a lot of crazy things on the console, to get the sound that I want. I know that there's something wrong with the actual speaker system. So it's real important to sort of have that reference point to sort of always fall back on, no matter whether you're in a control room or say a venue. So I guess the first thing I'd like to talk a little about is just engineering theory. Basically, doesn't matter whether you have one microphone through just a pair of small speakers or a hundred inputs at, you know, Kudos Arena. It's still basically the same theory, which is you're taking however many mics you have and trying to mix them into a sound that fits into that room using whatever speaker system you have. Now, that's it's a finite thing. I like to look at it like sound is like a, a blank canvas when you're starting. You have, a, you have a blank canvas that you're starting with, like you're making a painting. Now, you always start with the, the main theory of doing sound is starting with the bass instrument. That's why a lot of times you see sound checks, people start with the drums. Because low end is much harder to deal with than high end. Because what happens is, 
is an old, it's an old term called masking frequencies. Has anyone ever heard that term before? Do you, do you know what it means? I'll just give a little my explanation of it. If you have, say, a kick drum, and that kick drum, that peak frequency of that kick drum happens to be 60 cycles. Then you add the bass guitar. Not only can't you use 60 cycles in that bass guitar, because they'll, they'll fight each other, and then you'll have what's called phase cancellation, you actually have to get rid of that frequency in that second instrument so it matches. And if you've ever been to a concert where it just sounds like mud, it's because the engineer doesn't understand the term of masking frequencies. And what a lot of engineers do is they'll, they'll listen to every input individually and try to make every input sound great on its own. But the whole purpose of sound is not to make things sound great on its own, it's to make them sound good all together. So what ends up happening is if you Take the kick, the kick drum, make it sound fantastic. Then take the snare drum, make it sound, then the bass, whatever, all the different instruments, and then try to put them together. You'll never distinguish because they're masking frequencies. Okay, so the first thing you have to understand is how, it's not just about that one instrument, it's about how they fit together. Now that's, that's just as important whether we're talking about live sound, which is front of house, you're mixing for the audience, whether you're talking about monitors, which is what the artist here is to be able to sing or play, or in, even more important, in the studio. Because if they don't get that one thing right, it doesn't matter how great the music is or how great they're in, it's gonna sound horrible. So that having an understanding of that one concept is probably the one thing that I've that, that I've used more than anything in my career. Um, I guess when you're talking, let's let's talk about monitors for a minute. Um, you know, back. Hi. Hello. That's okay. Back when live sound had its its infancy, they didn't. You know, like for the Beatles to chase in, they didn't have monitors. It was no fold back. They were just singing blind. All of a sudden, one day, someone decided, hey, I'll have, you know, this all started with recording studios, how on a studio console, it's all bussing. You know, for live sound, it's everything gets sent to a left and a right or say a mono. But in the studio, it's all bussing. Each channel buses to a track or if you have eight tracks, they all bust to eight so on and so forth. Someone had the idea, hey, let's point some speakers at the artist. We'll bus the certain inputs back. So that's monitoring was born. Now, why is that important? It's important because if you're playing in like a small nightclub, it's really not that big a deal because everyone's sort of in the same general listening area and it's very easy for the singer to hear the drummer and so on and so forth. Once you get into these bigger venues like say Kudos or state the any kind of theaters, it might, it's harder for, you know, it might be easy for the guitar player to hear his amp, but remember the singer doesn't have an amp. That monitor is the singer's amp or say the drummer. Now, monitors is all about two things. It's about pitch and timing, which is very important if anyone's ever gonna do any kind of monitoring, whether it's in the studio or live. When I say the studio, let's say someone is singing, they're doing their vocal track and they're singing. You have to make sure that whatever the, whatever they need to pitch to in that song, they need to be able to hear so when everything's mixed together, it sounds right. If they can't hear, say, the piano or the guitar or whatever, they're not going to be able to pitch right and they're not going to be able to sing properly. Same with live sound. And timing is very simply whatever the percussion instrument might be. With most, mostly we're talking about drums, but you know, it's a lot of music doesn't have drums. I've I've done I've done some I've done a few I did a Barbra Streisand tour once where 
it wasn't a rock and roll tour. We had a 70 piece orchestra. So the, her pitching was not off like straight kick snare hat, which is what I normally used to, it was off. We had two percussion players. I think all told I had 24 percussion mics. That's just for the two percussion players. So trying to find whatever that percussion player was using for the timing, she needed to hear otherwise, you know, not good. Does that make sense? <laughs> so that, you know, the reason I'm starting with monitoring is because monitoring sort of is the key to whether you're in the studio or live to making sure that A, the performance can be good because we have this, this old saying, you can't polish a turd, you know, with live sound. If the, if the sounds coming off the stage aren't good, it's not, you're not gonna just all of a sudden turn a bad guitar sound into an awesome sound just because you're a good engineer or you have a great PA. It's gotta be good from the source. So understanding what, what the capabilities are when you're listening to the original sound before you do anything to it and understanding what you're capable of doing with that sound is very important. Um, goes the same for singers. Um, I've worked with some very old singers that have bad mic technique. Now, in the studio, as you know, or well, anyone who's worked in the studio, you can, when you're in a vocal booth doing your voice, there's nothing else bleeding into that microphone. And there's no feedback because they're wearing headphones. So singers are used to doing the dynamics by moving in and out. And that's a very old school approach to mic technique. But with live sound, that just doesn't work. I worked with a singer, very famous singer, who just liked to hold the mic like this, you know, this far away, but wanted it to sound like it was in your face. Now that, this was a two year battle, which was an impossibility because with live sound, my technique is everything. This just doesn't work, it's never will. So the first thing when I have a singer that I can see is trying to do too much of this, I have to sort of teach them, you can do a little bit, you know, you get a really powerful singer that might have a very broad range. Yes, they're gonna have to do some of that. But most of that, especially in live sound, has to be left up to the engineer. So how do you control these varying inputs, as we might say? And the, the the easy answer would be compressors, right? We're talking about outboard gear a little bit. Now, everyone knows what a compressor is, right? It basically takes, if you, if you have a compressor and you set it at a 10 to one ratio, that means for every 10 dB that goes in, one dB is coming out, very simple concept. But the problem with using too much of those things is you sort of get away from what I talked about the meaning what the natural sound is. So when I first started doing sound, I still do it today, is when I get a band that, like I say, a band that has plays acoustic instruments, before I turn on the PA, anything, I like to go listen to what they're playing on stage. I might have them play without the singer, just a little bit so I can hear, what does the guitar sound like? What does their bass sound like? How is the drummer hitting the drums? You know, is there a... So I sort of get a idea in my head of what I'm gonna do with those sounds instead of just going right out and starting to look down. I've seen a lot of engineers, they look down, they're not paying attention to what's happening on the stage. They're just, oh, I've got this console, it's got all these buttons, I gotta hit every button, I gotta use every plugin, I gotta... And they sort of went from one to 10 without doing what's important, which is sort of using that imagination of what am I gonna do with that sound? Whether it's in the studio, which, in a recording studio, the possibilities are endless. There's almost nothing that you can't do in a studio. If you have, you don't need 
tons of gear. I mean, when I started, they didn't have a lot of high-end microphones. We had SM57s, SM58s, we had 421s, we had these mics, RE20s, which I'm sure you've seen a lot of radio announcers use. And that was pretty much it. Nowadays, there are a lot of studio mics that have come into the live sound form, which is good and bad. Why is it bad? It's the same, same reason of using the wrong speakers in a recording studio situation. Have you guys ever heard of these speakers, NS10s? You guys ever heard of these? Mm -hmm. They were very, they, it was the number one studio speaker for 20 years. Not because they sounded great, but because if you could make it was because they actually didn't sound very good, <laughs> if that makes sense. It was because if you could make your mix sound great on an NS10, not that it was a horrible sounding speaker, but it was a very flat speaker. It didn't have, like if you turn these on, what are these, Tannoys? Yeah. Yeah, you get Tannoys or Gentilex. They're beautiful sounding speakers, but they've got enhancement to it. They've got processing EQ. Now, if you use too much of that, when you're actually doing the recording, what ends up happening is when you take that that recording to say a car stereo or a home or a TV, let's say you're you're mixing for a television and you're listening to it on this one, it's not going to sound very good because you you're starting out with something that's too colored to begin with. A lot of these speakers have boosted high end or even boosted sub lows. The problem with that is, you know, you have a speaker, let's say you're mixing in the studio or live with a speaker that's got boosted sub lows, you're gonna find that you're, why am I pulling all the low end out of every channel out? Well, because my PA setup or my studio setup isn't set up right. So back to like sort of setting up your speaker system. The, I guess the easiest way I can explain this is always have the two reference points, a song, doesn't matter what it is, that you know what it sounds like. Now, for for 25 years, have you guys ever heard of a, actually of Steely Dan? You ever heard of a band called Steely Dan? Okay. These guys were the most purest audiophiles ever. And one of the things they're famous for is almost every live sound engineer from, say, 1975 till just recently used a Steely Dan song to tune the PA. Because what they were famous for is they didn't like using any EQ on their records. And what they would do is they would pick the right microphone, the right mic placement, straight to tape, nothing, no EQ, nothing. And then when they mixed, they would do the same thing. They would just use volume settings and mixing, if they didn't like the sound, they'd re-record it. And some of their records were recorded with no compression, no EQ, and whether you like the music or not, their, their records, from a sound point of view, sound very good. So for tuning PA systems, a lot of engineers would use their songs. But it doesn't really matter what song it is, as long as you know what it is. But you sort of have to be careful you don't want to pick, say, like a dance song that's got, you know, a lot of sub bass in it or a lot of super highs because then you're going to think your PA system has that or your studio owner has those frequencies when it doesn't. So it's important to have one song that you use as your reference point no matter where you go and a microphone, say an SM58 or whatever your mic of choice is. And the thing that I like to do is I like to plug the mic in and actually listen to my voice. Because one of the first times I mixed front of house in a in a big stadium, say like an indoor, the hardest places are like what well, kudos, you guys know all been to kudos arena. Those basketballs arenas are very hard. You know, outdoor gigs are very easy because the sound doesn't bounce up anything. It comes out of the speakers, dissipates, and it's very easy to get a good sound live. And in small clubs, it's very easy because it's a very tight environment. But these basketball arenas, which most of the big concerts have, are very hard. And I remember the first time I was mixing, I spent so much time concentrating on 
trying to make everything sound great when someone said, hey, you know, they're coming to hear the singer. And it dawned on me, okay, no matter what, no one's going to complain that the hi-hat doesn't sound very good. But if they can't hear the singer, man, it's not going to be good. So when I tune a PA, one of the last things I do is I plug in a mic and I just, you've heard people check one, two, and I talk through, I talk normally through, and I want to make sure it sounds natural before I do anything, put any inputs in. And if I do that, and then I play my reference song, whatever it is, then I know what it sounds like in my car. I know what it sounds like at home. I know what it sounds like on the worst speaker I can find. I know that my starting point is good. Now, I've done these tests before. I did a tour with this group called the Dixie Chicks one time. And we were doing our rehearsals. And because I hadn't worked with them before, for the first two days of rehearsals, I didn't use, we were in like a, you know, we were rehearsing in the place where we were gonna do the first concert. I didn't want to use the PA system because I wanted to learn the music before I started to deal with the room itself. So I just mixed on my headphones, which was very easy to get. You know, I didn't have to do a lot of EQ, anything, because I'm using my headphones. And after two days, I came in in the morning, I tuned the PA, you know, walk, basically tuning the PA means you want to make sure that you can try to make your speaker system sound the same everywhere you walk in the room. Now in a club, it's not really that hard because it's not that big of But when you're talking about a place like Kudos, you know, here's an example. You're sitting in the front row, you're very close to the subs, right? Now there's people sitting in the back. Now how do you make sure that the people in the front aren't getting killed with low end, but the people in the back can hear a nice even sound. Very difficult thing to do. But when you find engineers that sit at their soundboard and don't actually walk around the different places in the room, that's where the problems happen. Because it's not just making it sound good where you're sitting. You, you remember, you're mixing for everybody. So in any type of big environment, it's important to go to the closest point in the stage and hear what the, before you put any mics through, what is my song that I'm my reference song sound like when I walk around the room? Now, again, if I'm walking to the front of the stage and all I hear is and I go to the back, then I know I've got a problem with my subs. And I've got a, there's some, there's some tricks that we've learned with low end, like I said, is the hardest thing because Mid-range and high are basically directional sound. If you're, if you're not right in front of where the horn is, let's say that your speaker's right here and you're over here, all of a sudden the highs drop off. But that's not the same with low end. It's, how do I describe it? Low end, like, the room is the speaker. I don't know if that makes sense. But when you're... When you're listening to low end through a PA system, it's in, a, in any type of room, it's not just what's coming out of the box, but it's how is that room making that low end sound? Now, every room has inherent frequencies. Um, the bigger the room, the more frequencies you have to deal with. I'm using Kudos because I know you guys have been there. Take a place like Kudos Arena. When you start playing your music through the sound system, you're gonna, and you walk around the room, you're gonna hear the low end sound differently everywhere you go. And the key is to try to split up your speaker system in a way that say, have you ever heard the term front fill? What that means is the speakers that you have pointing towards the closest people have to be on a different send than the speakers that are pointing towards the upper seats. Otherwise, you can't, you know, you can't have the same volume. And that's just, instead of using just a left and a right, you've got to use sends. And that's, you know, if you're in a, like a, a nightclub situation or a small venue, 
it's not as important. But once you start to get into bigger venues, it's very important to split up your speaker system so you can have adjustments, say like for the side hangs, for the front fill, and for the subs. Now even nowadays, a lot of times you get these, we work with, if you guys ever heard of L Acoustics, VDOS, very famous French PA system. And there's another sound system, DNB. There's all these different companies. When you buy their PA systems, and a lot of these systems that you use, they come sort of set up at the factory. But there's things you can do. Sometimes, you know, they're they're sitting in some factory, and and maybe that speaker sounds great when they're listening to it. But when you put it in a room that's not so perfect, you've got to have the capability of making some changes, especially with the low end. And that's where a lot of times. I'll take the low end out of the left and the right feed and put it on an aux end so that I can adjust however much low end I want separate from the main sound of the box. I don't know if that makes sense. And that's, that's very important in your setup. So what I want to hear is when I play my song and I'm walking, whether it's a room like this or Kudos or even Anzac Stadium. I want to try to get as even a sound everywhere in the room as possible. So that's sort of the concept of how do you set up your PA system. Now, I guess now comes talking about mixing a little bit. Now, everyone's sort of here probably understands the concept of a, 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 a channel strip on a console. It's basically mic plugs in or a direct signal plugs in. There's an input gain, goes through whatever EQ and sends, and there's a fader that you choose where that fader is going to send it to, whether it's a mono signal, one send to all the speakers, a left and a right, or in, in an example of, say, like Kudos or a stadium, you might have a PA system might consist of left and a right, then two side hangs. You ever been to concerts where you see the left and the right PA and then you see the sides? Those sides are be on a separate feed. And as you get, if you've ever been to Anzac, a football stadium, a lot of times you'll see delay speakers that are far back on the field because two things happen with, with sound, with distance. First of all, as you get further away from the speaker, the highs drop off. And second, there's a delay that's noticeable. Now, in say a place like Kudos, or most indoor venues, the delay from the stage to the back seat is not noticeable. But when you get to a, like say a football stadium, if you're sitting in the back of the stadium, there's enough of a delay where you're gonna, it's like, it's like having, putting like an effect on the music. So. A lot of times what we have to do is we have to have additional speakers that are at a certain distance. Now, with that comes another sort of technique that we use, which is called time aligning, which is there might be a delay of, say, 10 milliseconds between that sound coming out of the main speaker system and you hearing it. So, of course, wherever those speakers are has to be delayed that exact amount so you don't notice the difference. If it's done wrong, you, I don't know if you've ever been to a concert where you've sit really far away and you're hearing this delay. So that's sort of something that's inherent with very big venues. And um, you know, I guess, I, mean, I love mixing in football stadiums because like I said, this, there's no more perfect environment than a big outdoor venue with you know a hundred speakers because what happens is whatever I put into this PA system comes out and just dissipates doesn't bounce anywhere and it's very easy to get a perfect sound but when I take the same band into kudos now all of a sudden I'm fighting to try to get the clarity and the, the you know the depth perception that I could get outdoors. So I don't know if that makes sense. Um, so now, talking about mixing a little bit. So now, 
take for example, I've, I've set up my PA so I know that it sounds even everywhere or in a studio, I know exactly what my speakers sound like. This gentleman showed me a picture of his studio and I noticed he had maybe four or five pair of speakers. Now that's good and bad because when you're recording, you want to sort of keep, you, your reference are those speakers. You want to make sure that you know what those speakers sound like. So when you, once you record something, that's going to, you know, and then you, someone listens to it in their car or on the television, it, it makes a big difference of what you were listening to when you recorded that, of how it's going to translate out in the real world. So it's very important to, referencing is, is pretty much everything. Now, talking about mixing a little bit, um, to me, you know, it, it doesn't matter whether you're mixing, say, a good example would be an acoustic guitar, like acoustic guitar and a vocal, two channels, guitar, vocal, okay? Or, say, like one of the last tours I did, um, Guns N' Roses, which was, say, 120 channels. You're, you're still trying to do the same thing. You're taking that picture frame. I like to use the picture frame because if someone has, let's say someone's painting a picture of a landscape, once they paint that sky blue, they can't put anything else in that space because they've used that space that's used up. Once you put the drums in your PA system, and whatever frequencies those drums are using, like the term masking, they're, they're done. You cannot use them for anything else because your mix will then sound like they're, it'll sound like they're fighting each other instead of doing this. And it's very noticeable. I guess the two best examples are bass and a bass guitar or a subharmonic keyboard and a kick drum because it's much easier to say, take, say like an, another instrument that might share the same frequencies, a vocal and an electric guitar that might share frequencies in the range of say 800 cycles to say 2.2K. Does everyone know what I mean by those? That's sort of in the, in the mid to high mid. Now, if I, if I try to share the same frequencies with the vocal and the guitar, I'm not going to be able to distinguish between the two. They're just, it's just going to sound like mud. So when I'm listening to my, when I'm starting my sound check, I always start with the low end stuff first. And like I said, I, with rock music, you start with the kick drum. Why? Because that's the, that's the basis for all rock. And even though we don't necessarily go to the bass guitar next, we go to the snare drum. When I'm t tuning my snare drum, I don't try to make it sound all full and big and perfect using every frequency in my spectrum. I try to make it sound like a snare drum, which, you know, snare drums would never use frequencies below, say, I don't know, 250 cycles. Now, this third thing, which is very important, let's say we're talking about a hi-hat. Now we get into what I feel is the most important. There's one knob on a console, whether it's a digital console, analog console, that is probably the most important knob. It's called the high-pass filter. Do you guys all know what that is? Everyone knows what that is? Okay. Here's the reason why it's very important, and I'll use a this is something that a lot of engineers don't understand. This can, this one thing can either turn your mix into pure shit or the best fucking thing you ever heard in your life. And it's a very simple concept. Okay, you've got a hi-hat. Now a hi-hat is a very narrow range of frequencies that it produces, right? Say in the range of say, 10K, maybe, depending on the size, down to say 2K. That's it. Now, if you take a microphone and put it on the hi-hat and 
you set it up in a way that it's letting in any other frequencies other than those, that very small bandwidth, that will come back to bite you when you try to do your whole mix. Because now what's happening is, let's say you, and you can try this sometime. Put your head, let's say you're in a venue at your, at your club or somewhere. Put your headphones on, don't do any EQ to the hi-hat, put it on and cue it up and listen to it. And you will hear so much room sound. And let's say the band starts playing, you will hear just as much guitar and bass and ambience coming through that particular microphone as you would the actual sound. Because a hi-hat isn't very loud. Same thing goes for overhead mics. I've seen this a hundred times. Guys get a beautiful drum set, and all of a sudden, they want to make the cymbal sound perfect, so they turn the overhead mics on. They don't understand what the high pass filter does, and when the band starts playing, they can't understand why their mix just turned to pure shit. It's because if they queued up, they solo it up, it's the same, well, it's not the same thing in the studio, because I guess when you're in a studio, you're and the drum, a lot of times when the drummer's playing, there's nothing else going on. So that's probably not the best example. But if you queued up your overheads in a live environment, you would hear so much. The room sound sometimes would be louder than the actual symbols that you're trying to amplify. So the number one trick is to understand the frequencies that that particular... Now, this is more important with, say, a lot of these things we're talking about use condenser mics. Um, condenser mics are, I guess, they're very good for taking low input sounds and amplifying them. That's, you know, you can't take a condenser mic and scream into it, you'll overload it, but you can amplify a very quiet sound perfectly if you understand the concept of the high pass filter, which basically that one knob will, let's say you sweep it up to say, a hundred cycles. That means that nothing below that is getting into that microphone. So when I'm setting up my hi-hat mic, I'll sweep that, I'll make sure I pull out every frequency, I'll, I'll decide what type of sound I want on that hi-hat, and everything below 800 cycles or 1K or whatever is gone. That means when I cue that up, all I'm hearing is that hi-hat. I'm not hearing ambient <coughs> frequencies. And that's where Mic, I guess mic technique would be, mic technique for live sound is, again, one of the most important things. There's no, in a studio, when you're recording drums, a lot of times, engineers will do these tricks where they'll, you know, they'll close mic the kick drum, they'll close mic all the drums, but then they'll, they'll take some beautiful Neumanns and put them on the other end of the room, and what they're doing is they're recording the sound of the room. The, the room is actually a sound. It's not just the drums, it's the, it's the room that's creating the sound that they're recording to, to get the drum sound they're looking for. In live sound, there's, you can't do stuff like that. Everything has to be close mic because the problem with live sound is every, like, I, like what I was trying to explain before, there's a very finite window that a PA system can reproduce. It's not infinite. A lot of guys think if I just, I can boost up the high end all I want, I'm gonna get the most crystal clear sound like I get in the studio. Or when I'm listening to that record, her voice sounds pss, crystal clear. That's not always possible live. Depends on a lot of factors. Number one, the room you're in. If the room is an inherent bassy room and you're trying to get this crystal clear sound, it's gonna be very hard. So that's where mic technique is extremely important and understanding the high pass filter and, and EQ is very important. And making sure that your, your microphone is only picking up the frequencies that that particular instrument is producing. Does everyone sort of understand that concept? That to me is the, the difference between a great sounding mix, whether it's in a studio live and the worst shit you ever heard where you're you're sitting there and you're going god i see the guy playing but i can't hear the notes I'm, i don't know if any of you guys have ever been to a show where you, you're like 
this is the sound is horrible. It's it's usually not the equipment. It's usually the engineer that doesn't have a concept. And like nowadays, I remember when I started, we had one or two live consoles. Very only JBL was the only company that made speakers. Every PA system, every sound company built their own boxes and you had to set it up. But nowadays, there's beautiful, amazing sounding PAs out there now, tons of them. The shows that we did in the, say, in the, when I, I started in 1980, 81, the shows that we did in the 80s and even the shows that I went to in the 70s as a kid sounded just as good as the shows today because it's not necessarily the equipment. It's the people behind the console. I, I met this, I've done a lot of recording stuff. I met this one German engineer that once told me, if you can't take an SM57 and put it on every instrument and make it sound great, you have no business being behind the console. It's, it's, it's not until you can understand the concept of what did the, this one mic, how can I make this, that you can start using all these other mics. And now with digital consoles, you find, um, you guys are all familiar with plugins, right? Everyone knows what a plugin is. Um, I see it all the time. You get these guys, they, they, they have a console, they have 200 plugins, they want to use every single plugin, and they miss the big picture, which is, okay, how about if I go back to the concept I was talking about before with Steely Dan, how about if I just take a microphone, I listen to a sound, I try to reproduce that sound without using any of the toys, once I've done that and I'm listening to a mix that I think sounds good, now I can go in and start experimenting and say, okay, I want to take that sound and I want to, I want to EQ the hell out of that guitar or say bass, for example. Sometimes, here's a good example. There's, there's a trick. A lot of times, like I was talking about before, the hardest thing is making your bass and your drums sound good and not muddy. Now, one of the tricks that, that I, it used to drive me crazy, but what we would do is not only would we, if let's say I made my kick drum sound exactly the way I wanted, that's the one instrument that you can make sound the way you want, because it's the first one you're starting with. And that's gonna fill a space in your canvas that then you can't use. Now, when I then try to add my bass guitar, not only will I get rid of the frequencies that I'm using in the kick drum, but I will enhance frequencies that I'm not using in that to try to bring out the notes. And a lot of times those, especially for say rock music, I find those frequencies to be in the range of say, from 200 to say 800 cycles. Now, if you listen to that bass guitar alone, you're gonna go, oh my God, that sounds horrible. It's, it's all mid-rangey, I, I can't even listen to it. But then when you place it with the drums, it all of a sudden, you know, okay, now I can hear the notes. And I did this tour with this, uh, have you ever heard of a group called the Stray Cats? Anyone ever? Old group from the 80s, Stray Cats, Rockabilly. And the guitar player was in a side project called the Honey Drippers. And the lead singer was Robert Plant. He went on this tour and Brian said to the singer said, hey, one of my friends is gonna come on the tour with us and he's gonna sit out front. It happened to be Robert Plant. So I did this whole tour where it was me, a monitor guy, and Robert Plant was our other crew guy. He came on the whole tour and he sat out front with me every night. And he taught me this one thing that I talked about, which is how to take an instrument and make it so you can, you're looking at the stage going, God, I, I see the guy playing, but I just can't place the notes. How do you bring that out? So all of a sudden it's in your face and it's by enhancing these frequencies that aren't being used by other instruments in that range. And when you're, when you're setting it up like that, you go, oh, it just doesn't make sense. But when you, and if you, any of you guys, if you ever experiment, whether it's in the studio or live, 
you will see that all of a sudden, not only can you hear it, but you can, I don't know if this makes sense, but you can actually see it. Like when I go to a concert, I try not only to hear the music, I'm looking at the stage, especially nowadays, you get these bands that have so many sounds coming off the stage. Music now, you know, when, when I went to concerts when I was a kid, you know, you had like the Rolling Stones, it was a five piece band. There was only five instruments, not that many things to mix. Nowadays, music is very complicated. There's a lot of sounds coming at you from a lot of this music and you want to, when you go to see it live, you want to get that same feeling that when you listen to the record, you want to hear all those different sounds. And that's very, the more inputs, the harder it is. So when, when, whether I'm mixing or listening, I'm not only listening, but I'm trying to see it. And I do this when I'm mixing front of house or whether I'm listening. I'm looking at the stage and I might pick out the guitar or a percussion instrument or anything. And I'm trying to pick that out of the mix. And if I can't pick it out, then something's wrong with my mix or something's wrong with the mix the guy's doing. And that's something, I don't know if you've been to a lot of concerts or worked with a lot, of, a lot of times you see these guys, they, their heads down, they're focused on the console, they're turning on, they're not focusing on what's happening on the stage because even though, sure, sound, what we're talking about audio is a very technical thing. Right? We're, we're using sophisticated pieces of equipment. But the concept of what we're doing is all purely artistic. Because if we don't, if we just go into it from a technical point of view, we're not going to understand what we're really trying to achieve, which is, say, an example of an acoustic guitar and a singer. We're just trying to reproduce whatever that musician is doing for the masses, whether it be 500 people. I don't know, I've done shows where I've mixed for 80,000 people or a recording where I'm gonna do a mix that's then now gonna be cemented on some type of medium, CD, cassette, whatever, and people are gonna to listen to in every listening environment, whether it's earbuds, a little television, and I want to make sure that that I'm, re, that I'm doing justice to whatever the artist intended their music. Because I worked for, I worked with some pretty picky artists. One of the pickiest of all time was, was Prince. And he, <laughs> I worked with him for like three or four years and he was just, he used to just drive me fucking crazy. And one day I was like, you know, what? He says, you have to understand. This time that I'm spending with you now is the only time that I have to have input on my sound. When I'm playing on stage, I have no fucking idea what you're doing. I can't hear it. I only hear the monitors. I don't hear the front house. Okay. so. I'm trying to impress upon you in this particular time frame, sound check, what I want down the road. And it made me sort of, it drove me crazy until he explained it to me like that. Whereas it's sort of a big, it's kind of sounds a little melodramatic, but it's sort of a big responsibility to be a sound engineer, a live sound engineer, because in the studio, they might, they'll record the music, but they'll come back in the control room and they'll listen to it. And the artist will have a lot of input whether they're in there when you're mixing or they just come and listen to your mixes, they have a lot of input on the finished product. Live sound, they have no input. They can only give you the direction they can give you, and then it's, you like what we call, you've heard the term, the fifth beetle. You like the fifth beetle, which it's a very powerful thing because when you're, uh, then you guys do live sound. Okay. The one thing I always loved about live sound is Good or bad, when the show starts, and you're a front of house or a monitor engineer, there's no one else to look at. It's all on you, and it's happening in real time. There's no stopping. Well, we'll get into a few stories, maybe, but there's, <laughs> there's been a few stops. I've, I've worked for some artists that have actually 
heard things they hated and actually stopped in the middle of the show and called me out over the microphone. It's happened a few times. Uh, and trust me, that's no place you ever really want to be. But most of that is purely their paranoia of the fact that they, once they start their show, they know that you have all the power of making the sound what you want. You can either listen to them or not. You're going to do, and they really have no idea what you did. All they know is whatever their friends might have told them. So it's, it, it's a very powerful thing being a live sound engineer because once you're out there, you're pretty much on your own to do, you know, what you feel is interpreting the music properly. So I guess sort of what I'm getting at is it's, it's very easy to get lost in all the technology, but I guess it's easier for me because I, I come from a time before any of this technology. I mean, I remember in America we travel and when we go on, on big tours, we travel in these tour buses, they're like houses. And we might do a show in New York City, but the next show is in Philadelphia. Well, we don't stay in a hotel that night. We do our loadout, pack the trucks, get in this bus, sleep on the bus, drive to the next venue, set up, do it all again. And I can remember, I guess it was maybe about 1984, 85. I, I remember like it was yesterday, I was sitting in the lounge of the bus after a show going, man, you ever think there's gonna be a day where you could just hit a button and it'll save everything that you do? And at this time, it didn't exist. It did not exist. What we used to do was, everything was analog, and we had little cards. And for, let's say you do, um, let's say you've got a ballad, right? Let's say you're doing, um, you know, Guns N' Roses, right? Here is the other there's a big difference between the mix you're gonna do for Welcome to the Jungle and the song Patience. You familiar with those two songs? Yeah. Okay, one is a hard hitting rock that's gonna have very loud inputs and the other one is a completely quiet thing. Now, what your mix is gonna be like is you try to use the mix for Welcome to the Jungle on Patience, you got a big problem. Nowadays, it's very easy. You've got <laughs> snapshots, everyone knows what a snapshot is, and you, you get your settings on your digital console, boom, you hit the save button, you go on, you game over. Before digital consoles, it wasn't like that. We had index cards and we used to use tape and you'd, you'd put little tape marks on the faders and you know, you'd have to really quickly, you know, reset your faders. And back then, everyone knows what subgroups are, right? Nowadays with digital consoles, it's not so, a lot of guys sort of get away from it because they can, save whatever settings they want from one song to the next. I like to think of things in terms of grouping, right? Most consoles have eight, whether we call them subroots or VCAs, you know, v VCAs, right? And, well, okay, when I did say, um, I did two, two tours with big orchestras. One was Barbra Streisand and one was this Spanish singer, Julio Iglesias. And it was a singer with a 65 piece orchestra. Now that's like 150 inputs. And it's just physically impossible to control all those inputs in a live environment. So you've got to take all those channels and group them down to say eight subgroups. Percussion, bass, melody, you know, say like violin, you know, whatever, mid-range stuff, violins, instrument stuff, vocals, so that it's easy to control that stuff as in a manual setting, because it's very easy now to get lost in the technology with the digital world where almost anything is possible. I, um, I had a friend that used to mix for this, the band Rush. Have you ever heard of the band Rush? Yeah. For one concert, he had 250 snapshots. Now that's say 30 songs. Now do the math, that's, you know, that's a lot of snapshots. But what he was able to do was every 
but it was the, the, the chorus, the verse. Everything had a snapshot, and he was able to... Now we have Pro Tools. You all know what Pro Tools is, right? So now we can... I use this a lot um, in live sound. You can track your live performance. You can go back and dial in your mix perfect and you know do do crossfades and everything. And a lot of the old manual technique of mixing is taken away from it. And a lot of times I see guys now, especially, well, there's another type of engineer. I don't know if you guys, have you ever heard the term system engineer? Do you guys know what that is? On a big tour, there's a guy that's in charge of the PA system and the front of house engineer. Because like I said, front of house engineer, once the show starts, can't leave the console. But the whole, the whole game to live sound is to make it sound good everywhere. So usually what the system engineer does is he walks around the room with a little tablet that has little controls over the sides, and a lot of times we'll, you'll go to Kudos, you'll see a main array of speakers. You've all seen it, right? That's not just one set of speakers that's having one signal. Usually it's split up in the bottom, a couple of speakers are on one feed, and then the top ones are on other feed, because remember those bottom ones that are usually curved around are pointing, might be right here, and are only trying to produce sound for say 20 meters but those top ones are trying to shoot to like the back of the room well it stands to reason that your your volume and your EQ settings for those top speakers are going to be different than the bottom ones a perfect example is the bottom ones usually have extra horns in them so the because the first thing to drop off is high end so that the highs will you know, produce farther to get the nosebleeds, you know, the back seats sounding really good. Um, I'll use, you very rarely go to a concert, say, at say, Kudos or anything, where you see what I used, what I call delay speakers. Usually you go and they've got the main PA and the side PA and there's nothing back in the room. But on the Streisand tour, she was so anal about the sound. She wanted she wanted to make sure that the person sitting in the back row could hear when she was whispering. So not only did we have the main PA, but we had, you've seen like a kudos where, you know, the floor is like this, is like an oval, right? Right where the back oval, we had six delay speakers. So now the people sitting in that back curb section had speakers just as close to them as the people on the floor. So their, their definition was the same. Because with live sound, it's, you know, when I first started doing monitors, we talk, we talk about my first show, which was Iggy Pop, okay? I was the monitor engineer. And the first kind of problem that I ran into was how do I get the singer's, how do I get the microphone and the singer's voice to carry over, say, the guy with two Marshall stacks playing a 10, okay? Microphones and speakers were not invented to be in the same room together, okay? I worked for this guy, Steve Miller. One time, you ever heard of Steve Miller? And he had a friend who I'm sure you guys have heard of the guitar, Les Paul, right? Okay. That's an actual guy who's a guitar player, Les Paul. And he, I met him one time. And not only is he, I don't know if you guys know this, not only is he the inventor of the Les Paul, but he's the person that invented multi-track recording. Did you guys know that? Okay. And what he, he's the one who explained to me what masking frequencies is, but he also told me that Live sound is an industry with two things that were not invented to be working together. Microphones were made for radio. They weren't made to be, to amplify, that's where, why you have feedback. There are two things that were not meant to be in the same room. So 
one of the hardest things with monitoring is how do I get that microphone, that singer's voice to sound good because the speaker's pointing, pointing at them. And what I learned very quickly, and it's carried over into live set, into mixing front houses, if you don't have enough speakers pointing at the right people, doesn't matter what you do, it's not gonna sound good. So if you go to say a, a venue and they don't have enough PA, or it's not pointing in the right place, doesn't matter what you do after that, it's gonna be shit. So it all starts from, again, the setup. How do I go into a situation, whether it's a studio or live, and make sure that everything that I do from the beginning is gonna give me the end result that I'm looking for, which is a good sound. Now, if I fuck up the setup, but I do everything perfect on the console, it doesn't matter, it's not gonna be right. So it's very important to not overlook any of the very simple steps that you're taking along the way, whether it's in the studio or live. And I see a lot of guys, we have this program, Smart, which I'm sure you guys have heard of. And what guys like to do with Smart, which I don't really like, is they like to try to EQ their PA system so they see a flat line. So it's flat. There's no such thing. Flat is just a term, a, a, an audio term, but that's not what we're doing. We're not trying to, audio isn't done on a, on a screen, it's done with your ears. So that's why I don't like to use these tuning programs. I like to use my ears. I might sometimes in a big room, check what I'm doing with smart. I might want to see, okay, I've just tuned the PA. It sounds really good. I want to see how it's reacting. I might look at it. And if I notice that this, wow, I'm having a tr trouble with the low end and I see a real bump in 80 cycles, I might realize that this room, no matter what I do, has this inherent, which a lot of these indoor rooms have, this inherent frequency that I'm just never going to get rid of. So. When I'm mixing, I, and I have an understanding of certain things that I can't control, I'm not trying to fight it with more volume, more EQ. I've seen it, you know, guys sometimes try to overcome a bad room with pushing the volume too far. It again comes back to there is a finite point of what certain rooms can handle and what most speaker systems can produce. Does that, does that make sense? Um, all right, well, I've talked for a while. That you guys want to ask any questions about some of the stuff I or anything you guys want to hear about? Anybody? So, did you do the Not This Lifetime tour? Yes. Did you do San Francisco, like in the baseball arena? What the Guns N' Roses? Yeah, yeah. No, what what happened was, um, well, this is sort of. I got married at a at a late age, and I have a ten year old, and. I worked for Guns N' Roses for a long time, and I'm I'm sort of semi-retired. But when they went to do this last tour, yeah. I was looking at being away for five years, and it was just too much. My son just wasn't having it, and so I what I did is I did the I, I did something that was really cool, which was uh I got to do the ACDC tour where he was the singer, oh, which is fantastic. Cool. We we were in rehearsals for that tour and we were gonna do Coachella. And the first show we did um, was at this place called The Troubadour, which is a small club in LA where a lot of Led Zeppelin, all these big Guns N' Roses all did their first shows. It holds like 100 people. We did a show at um, The Troubadour and Axel slipped and broke his foot. I don't know if you guys have ever heard this, broke his foot. And the next day, the, our production manager happened to be the production manager for ACDC. While this was happening is when their singer had his ear troubles and in the middle of the tour said, hey, I'm done, I'm quitting, tour's over. Now, Angus is one of the coolest guys I've ever met. He wasn't having it. He's like, fuck you, I started this tour and I'm finishing this tour. I don't care if it's with you or someone else. <laughs> so they decided to have auditions for singers. And what they didn't know is Axel heard about this and he had someone call Angus and say, hey, I'm interested, I will come and audition. So 
it was all secret, but it got out really fast. We, we were in rehearsals in LA. He got a private jet. It was me and Axel and his manager. We flew all secret to Atlanta. And boom, next day we walk into a room and there's ACDC. And, you know, we're Axel's auditioning. So we did a one day audition. And in, in pure anger, he says, All right, I'll let you know. And Axel was kind of like freaking out because he's like, Wait a minute, what do you mean you'll let me know? You know, <laughs> like he wanted to know right now, but there was none of that. So we went back to LA. He made us wait. Now, remember, he had a broken foot, so he's in a wheelchair. So it was it was a very surreal time. Went back to LA. We we're doing rehearsals for Coachella, and we get the call, hey, you're in. You know, you know, they listened to recordings. They just wanted to make sure that it was, they didn't want to, he, Angus didn't want to be put under pressure to make it. So all of a sudden, we were told, hey, we're doing this. So we did, um, we did two shows in Vegas. We did Coachella. And then we flew to Europe and did five weeks where he was the singer for ACDC. And that was just, that was fantastic. Because yeah. first of all, that was, that was Axel's all-time favorite band of all. Now he's the lead singer of ACDC, which was fantastic. And they had their own monitor engineer, but I got to go along and mix his monitors, which was great. So there was two of us. So it was, it was a great experience. And then... I, I had moved to Sydney to retire right before that tour started, and I spent my whole career watching other people have kids, and I was on the road touring, and then when I had a kid, my son, I, was, I remember I was in Europe with ACDC, and he said, Dad, you know, you have a job in Sydney, because I took a job with this company, JBJ, why do you got to do that job? That takes you away, why can't you? And it hit me like, there, it's time. So I finished the ACDC tour, put someone else. They're still on tour now. This is, they're mm. doing their last leg now this summer. So that's three years I would have missed. And what I've seen a lot of people do is they miss their whole families growing up because they're on tour the whole time. So I got married late in life, but I was smart enough to call it quits. But now I think I'm going back. <laughs> because the funny thing is, my my wife had sort of noticed that I hate go like I miss I I you know I've had I had a really long career I got to do you know Guns N' Roses Prince Madonna Van Halen some some uh, acts that I <laughs> worshipped as a kid and now I work in an office and what I do is I I work for you guys know JPJ you know what the sound company here in Sydney we. Do all the, I just basically make sure that the, I liaison between the bands, engineers, and what equipment, because most of the bands that come here don't bring their sound systems. Whereas when a, when a big group like, say, Paul McCartney is on tour, they bring that PA everywhere in the world. They just don't bring it to Australia. And the reason is, it's because it's, it's very expensive to take all that stuff, put it on a plane. So we supply everything for most of the bands that come here, especially the big stadium shows. But now I had, you know, it's been a couple of years. An opportunity about a month ago came up where I got this call, Fleetwood Mac's going back on tour and they're firing Lindsey Buckingham and they're gonna do a rehearsal to decide who the new members are. And they wanted if I want to come and do this rehearsal. So I said, sure, of course, well, definitely. They ended up being in such a rush that Mick Fleetwood lives in Maui, that he did the rehearsal in his living room and they hired Neil, Neil Finn is gonna be in it and uh, the guitar player from Tom Petty. So I'm, I'm on the short list to be the engineer for that tour, but I still haven't decided whether I want to you know, go back. It's a year long tour, but we'll see. We'll see if I do it or not. I kind of feel like I have one more, one more in me. You know, <laughs> anyway, so Good you. any other questions? Any How questions? Old you, man? How old are you? I'm, I'm 50, 57. Yeah, I was born in 1960. 57 years old. Yeah, I started. I did my first tour in 1981 with Iggy Pop, 
I never had another job. I did just world tours until the last show of ACDC, which was two years ago. Stupid. So, ACDC played my school there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's, now, again, I've, I've done mostly monitors, but I've done a lot of front of house. I got to do front of house for Stray Cats, Iggy, Dixie Chicks, a bunch of different groups. But my specialty is monitors because that's sort of where the, I like the pressure. It's a lot of pressure when you're doing monitors for some of these artists. You know, you're dealing with egos. Like, you know, they, it's just, it's, it can be extremely difficult, but it can also be very rewarding because, you know, when monitors can be a very hard thing. You get these artists, they, you know, in the bigger rooms, it's very hard. They, they want perfection. Perfection isn't, is, it's a myth. It's when it comes to audio, it's, it's a myth. You know, it's, perfection is whatever that person has in their mind that they now, you know, with, with monitoring, especially with singers, if a singer's having a bad night, it doesn't matter what I did, it's my fault. <laughs> you know, so that's part of, part of being, like, hey, I'll, I'll, do, you guys, do you guys want to hear, instead of some, tell you want to hear some good stories? Okay. Yeah. I did, Van Halen did their reunion with David Lee Roth, okay? My, one of my close friends was, was the monitor guy for the entire Sammy Hagar portion of Van Halen. And these guys are, well, the biggest assholes you'd ever want to meet in your life. Just, they feel like they, they're up here and they're down here. Now this guy's been with them for so long, and the most difficult guy is Alex Van Halen. This monitor guy got to the point where he just, they were in the middle of the first tour back with David Lee Roth, and he just called, he says, listen, I've had it with this guy. I gotta get out of here. The money's tremendous. Can you come out here for two months? I'll eventually come back, but just come take over for me. No problem. When I was a kid in Van Halen, I, it was, I was jumped at the chance. So I went out and he said, listen, man, it, everything might be perfect for a couple weeks, but one night he's going to lose it on you. He's going to freak out. You're not going to know what happened. So sure enough, we, we go on tour about a month into the tour. About halfway through the show, all of a sudden, Alex starts throwing drumsticks at me. Like, <laughs> and, like, like I'm so, what the fuck? <laughs> and his tech is running over, he's freaking out. I'm like, dude, I haven't touched his mix since I got here. Yeah. This is the same mix he's had for like two years. But whatever, something happened, and he freaked out. So the show was finished, and I went into the office and said, hey, just so you guys know, I'm, I'm getting fired. They're like, no, what are you talking about? I go, trust me. So I got on the bus, we did the drive. We land in Vegas, the manager meets me, he says, you're right, you're going home, they're bringing back Jerry. Now, me and this guy, Jerry, were best friends. Jerry was so pissed because they never called him and said, hey, they just said, hey, we're gonna fire Blake, and get Jerry back. They never called Jerry and asked him if he could come back. So meanwhile, I lived in Lake Tahoe. I said, oh, no problem, I'm, I'm out of here. I went to the airport and I flew home. They called Jerry, said, hey, we fired Blake this year. He said, fuck you, I ain't coming back. <laughs> you got, now the next show was the next day in Los Angeles at the Staples Center, two nights. He's like, you better fucking figure something out because you know, that's one of my close friends. You don't, you don't do that. Exactly. So now I was home. I flown home, which took an hour. I drove, my wife picked me up. I got home, I was home 10 minutes. And the phone rang and it's their manager. Hey, you're not gonna believe this, but you know, will you come back? I'm like, sure. He's like, you're kidding me, right? They thought there's no way. So when I got there, he said, why did you come back? I said, because you don't understand what an opportunity I have. They have to be nice to me now. <laughs> like, this is like the biggest fuck you ever. Now, here's the best part of the whole story, which was, so the next day I said, I'm not coming tonight. I'll fly in tomorrow. I lived in, in Lake Tahoe, which was like an hour flight from LA. 
The next show is in state. So I said, I will fly in tomorrow. Get me the latest flight you can where I get in about two o'clock because sound check was at four. I flew in. I purposely went to lunch and I didn't show up at the venue until 3.30. I wanted to make them sweat a little bit. So I showed up and I come to sound check and the first thing Eddie comes in and he comes up and he says, man, my brother's a fucking asshole. Fucking thank you so much. He's hugging me. He says, come on, let's go talk to him. So now we, me and Eddie go up on the drum riser and he's like, okay, Alex, what the fuck happened? And Alex is like, oh no, it's, it's all good. Don't worry about it. And Eddie's like, hey man, tonight's really important to me. Like, obviously something happened. What the fuck? So this is the three of us. And Alex is like, no, it's fine. Just it's fine. So I realize I, I can see what's happening here. So I, I sort of sort of say, hey, you know, I'll talk to you guys later. You know, you guys talk amongst yourselves. I go back to the console, I put my headphones on, and I cue up the overheads. And I hear Alex going, dude, shut the fuck up. You know me. I just freaked out. If I start telling him something's wrong, he's going to fucking change everything, and it's going to all be fucked up. Just, there was nothing wrong. <laughs> it was fine. I just freaked out. So now, that's how I ended up getting this Barbara Streisand tour, which... The reason that was th their manager also managed Barbara Streisand, and that's sort of she very rarely went on tour. And for an engineer to mix for Streisand was a big deal because she's she's very most unless you're in in the industry you wouldn't know, but she's very picky, and it's 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 a great thing to have on your resume. So he said, "Man, I'm gonna I'm gonna take care of you." And then uh, about a year later, I got this and. The big thing I didn't do is I didn't ask for any, like a lot of times in these situations when this happens all the time, guys are like, okay, no problem. I want 10 grand a week, double my salary. But I didn't ask for any more money. I came back for the same money because it was just, it was just enough for me, them to ha like, and I, and Jerry didn't come back. He, he purposely stayed home for another three weeks. He was supposed to come back in a week. He said, nope. You're gonna live with Blake for three weeks. And if you fucking give him a hard time, I'm not coming back. And so I stayed out there for another three weeks and he was a pussy cat there, right? Cause he knew, you know, he, you know, that's a typical example of and nothing wrong. I get fired and sent home and you know, I didn't take it personal because I understand the sort of the egos that, that I'm dealing with. Prince was sort of, Prince was sort of the same way. There's a good, do you guys want to hear another? Is it? Yeah. Okay. Um, I was doing a Prince tour and we were playing in Washington, DC. We were in the middle of the tour. And uh, this was a tour when he was having a fight with his record company and he wasn't using the name Prince. It was for legal reasons. He was, he was the glyph, the sign and he actually didn't have a name. We were supposed to call him Dude. That was how we were supposed to address him. So one day we were finished sound check and I'm sitting at the monitor console and we have a talk back mic where, you know, the front house guy has a mic through the monitor. And all of a sudden we, we were done with sound check. I had it by dinner. I was sitting reading a book or something. I hear this voice. Hey, Blake, could you come out to the front of house? And I'm like, okay. I look out there. There's fucking Prince out there. Nobody. I go out there and go, hey, where's John? Oh, he quit. He's gone. I'm like, what are you talking about? We just did sound check. When did he quit? Oh, we had an argument after sound check. He's, he's gone. You're going to have to do for out of house. So this was back before digital consoles. Now, the one thing the guy did before he quit is he went and he zeroed out the whole console. Oh. <laughs> Flattened out the whole thing. So I said, hey, man, I don't know if you realize, but the guy zeroed out the console. We have to start from scratch. Now, this is 615. They're holding the doors. And he's like, all right, well, I'll get the band and we'll we'll do a new sound check. And I'm like, OK, but I don't know if you understand. We've been on tour for a year. And if you think we're going to dial in the same kind of sound that you're used to in 10 minutes, it's yeah, not going to happen. Sure. So he got the band out and it was me and him. And I started going, doing our sound check, kick, it's there. And, it was acceptable, but a mix is built over, it's not done in 10 minutes. And band played. Meanwhile, the promoters there going, hey man, there's 15,000 people. We gotta let, you got five minutes. We, we're gonna have a ride. We gotta let the doors open. I said, man, you better get on the phone and fucking get this guy back because this is what it's gonna be for tonight. I mean, 
and you're not going to have a monitor engineer. Like, there was nobody. So sure enough, they made a call. He was already at the airport. He came back and came back with his index cards, had everything written down. <laughs> Told Prince, hey, just so you know, I'm the only one. Because Prince had this thing where he liked to touch the console. Because I don't know if you know, every Prince record that you ever heard, there's no musicians on. He played every instrument on every record. It's only live that he has a band in the studio because uh, he lived in his studio. Yeah. So, and he would record, he would play the instruments and record, do everything. So he would, sometimes I'd go to dinner and I'd come back and he'd be at my console. I'm like, what are you doing? He said, oh, I'm re EQing the, yeah, but we just did sound check. And yeah. it was funny because he, for the first two weeks of the tour, he used to say to me, I'd go see him after the show and he'd go, yeah, yeah, Soundcheck, how come Soundcheck was great, but it sounded different? And I never knew why. And then one day when I caught him, I'm like, dude, you've been hassling me for fucking a month. And here you are sneaking up there and changing. Oh, well, that shouldn't matter. I'm like, of course it matters. What are you talking about? So anyway, there's any technical things you guys want to? I've got a question. Sure. <clears throat> so it's... Um, it's not on a lifestyle, it's more on a studio work. Sure, absolutely. So, um, I'm, I'm quite a beginner, and I feel that my mix that I'm doing now feels a little bit um, flat, not, yep. as, not, as, not as high, not as tall as, 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 other, as other mixes. What would you recommend me um, to take a look at? Do you know what mastering is? Yeah. So you understand the concept of mastering? Mm. Okay. Are you doing any mastering? No. Okay. So a lot of times in studios, that's why everyone knows what mastering is. Okay. Yeah. There are guys that are famous. That's all they do is master. Basically, anyone that doesn't understand the concept of mastering is you'll do your mix, your two track mix, and you'll give it to someone and they will EQ those two tracks and do compression and different things to make that, just those two tracks sound completely different. Mm. And it's, it sounds very easy because you're talking about a left and a right. How hard could it be? It's tremendously hard. But the one good thing about the studio is you can't fuck it up because you can always go back and do it again. So what I would say is, like when I say experiment, I mean really experiment. Like Madonna taught me something about sound. There are these frequencies that, that we call air. Mm -hmm. They're anything above 10K. Now when you, when you reproduce a frequency like say 14K or 16K, it's very hard to hear. It's almost like a dog whistle. But when you do mastering and you add, say, 16K or 14K to a mix at, like, say, 3 dB, you understand parametric EQ, right? So if you, a lot of times what, what guys will do is they'll take the parametric EQ, which is all they ever use on a mastering, mm -hmm. and they'll take the bandwidth and they'll make it really wide, and they'll start it, say, at, 10, 12K. Anything below that is gonna affect the sound of your instruments. Or anything above that is just gonna affect the sound of your mix. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. There's no real instruments that produce 12, 16K. But when you add that to a mix, all of a sudden it can enhance, right? And the perception. now the same thing with low end. There's no instrument out there except maybe a subharmonic keyboard that'll produce 40 cycles. Even a kick drum, you know, the, the biggest 26 inch bass kick drum doesn't produce, but like nowadays, a lot of music now, especially dance music, they're using frequencies 40, 30 cycles where you, you'll hear these kick drum sounds that you know, first of all, are made by machines and that's how they're able to do, but they're producing these freak, these ultra low frequencies. And that can take just a sort of a flat mix and enhance it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And 
compression, which is it's, it's a very scary thing. Um, compressors can be used. It's the one thing that is can be used for two two things. A compressor can be used very simply to, like in television and radio, compressors are used for one thing, one thing only, to level out the sound. So if someone is whispering and then someone screams, it doesn't distort your television speaker. It levels the sound. That What they say is, it's usually they use like a, a 10 to one ratio. For every 10 dB we're putting in, one dB comes out. This way, and then they set the volume for the quietest thing. So the quietest thing is one level and the loudest thing is still that one level. But for mastering, you can play with, there's so many different settings, mm. you know, that you've got the ratio and the attack, there's so many different settings on a compressor. And when you start playing with those and listening to your mix, like let's say you've listened to your mix and you're happy with the balance mm -hmm. of the instruments. But then you listen back and, ah, uh, it just doesn't really jump out at me. Mm -hmm. That's probably a master. And you might find that, wow, I just boost 12K. All of a sudden, mm -hmm. I hear something crystal clear. I just don't know what it is. It's, it's that you brought out the, you brought out something in the, how do I, okay. Really? It's like the difference between if someone made a painting and they had used all low sheen paint. Mm -hmm. But then I was at um, Shelly Beach and there's a painter out there that uses this technique where he sort of bumps the paint so it sort of makes his painting look 3D. It's just a technique that he uses with regular paint. And all of a sudden he's using the same thing, but his little technique, just take that picture and all of a sudden it jumped out, it's made it look like 3D. So it's, you can take this very simple little thing like your EQ mm -hmm. or your compressor and just experiment the hell out of it because like that's the same thing with digital photography. Before you used to, with analog photography, you took a picture until you got it developed, you didn't know what you had. Now <laughs> you can take a picture on your phone and then you could Manipulate. change it a million times because that's the same thing in the studio. You have the capability of always going back and I also recommend Stepping, like sometimes when you when you work in the studio, I know I've spent like sessions in the studio, I've been there for eight, 10 hours and you just, you can't hear the music the same. It's it's just turned into a different, sometimes you gotta walk away yeah. and come back and sometimes the first time you listen to it the next day, it sounds completely different and you get an idea that you didn't have. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you gotta walk away from it and come back. Anybody? I'll tell you the other, well. I know, I was gonna say, so, so in the recent couple of years, um, I've come across bands that sort of have a soundless stage, where they want no sound on stage, it's all ears. What's the shift been like in the industry towards, in the workflows, in the live uh, okay. experience case? with having to use any monitors, using amps on the stage, and balancing that out, as well as balancing the light. That's an interesting question. I was the first engineer in the history of this planet to ever use ear monitors. This was back in, in 1989. I went to work for this guy, Steve Miller. None of these companies had ear monitors. There was one guy who's not in business anymore who was making these making these like homemade ear monitors and there was no wireless. And we basically came up with how to do ear monitors. The ear monitors is, is a great tool, but it also really sucks because bands, bands were meant to play together in the same room. Music is about in, uh, musicians interacting with each other and making one sound. And what ear monitors do is it takes each individual musician out of that place where they're playing with the other. And that was for the first 10 years that I did a lot of ear monitors. It was very hard for two reasons. First, bass, bass players and drummers weren't locking in. They weren't in the pocket as much because they were in their own little world. And singers, there was no more feedback. 
So singers could have as much volume as they want. And we used to get to the situation where they'd have so much, they could hear themselves so well that they started to not sing as powerfully. And front of house guys were having a big problem getting projection. And this was a front for like the first five years, front of house guys hated EMRs because all of a sudden before that, you know, singers were competing, you know, Axel with his mic and a couple of wedges was competing with Slash with, you know, or Angus with, you know, 10 Marshall stacks. You can't compete with that. Now with ear monitors, you can have, it, it's, it's, you can have it louder than you could listen to it. And in turn, they can save their voice, but they don't understand is now the front of house guy is there. So for a long time, the front of house really, for the first couple of years of ear monitors, the front of house really was sacrificed until it was hard for engineers. I was in, a, I, I've been in a few situations where the front of house guy would be, man, I can't even get his fucking voice over the, over the freaking hi-hat. He's singing so quiet. And there were times where I'd have to go to the singer and say, man, I'm, I really have to turn you down. The front of house guy's having a problem. You know, it's not just about the monitors, we're, it's about, the audience, if they can't hear you, what's the point? So that was a big problem there, Mars. So, yeah. So how does that get solved? And like, did just people get used to it, or did like they come to like an agreement? No, they ha they un they have to understand that they have to get back to <clears throat> ear monitors. Would say like um, like I don't know how do you describe it. Let's say does anyone does anyone here surf? Okay. Probably the hard, I, I didn't surf until I moved here. It's the hardest thing I've ever tried to do, okay? Imagine if you got in the water tomorrow and all of a sudden you could surf six foot waves, like instantly. That's what ear monitors did. It, it went from a singer having an impossible situation sometimes where there was no way to get that voice loud enough to compete with the stage. All of a sudden the next day, he could have whatever he wants. And it's like opening a can of worms that it took a while to, to get them to realize, hey, this isn't just about you and what you're hearing. Remember, there's 10,000 people out there that want to hear you too. And we have to make sure that we're, every, we're all working in concert. So there was some heated conversations, let's just say that. And there were some artists, there are some artists to this day that refuse, like Elton John would never put ear monitors in his head. Because to him, he's a purist. You know, bands were made to play together. But then there are some singers, like this Guns N' Roses tour would have never happened if it wouldn't been for ear monitors. It's the only thing that got Axel back with Slash on stage, is the fact that he can now hear his voice. It's that one thing. <laughs> and it's it's funny that you ask that, because um one of the rec prerequisites for them doing this tour is Axel said, I'm only doing this tour if everyone's on ear monitors. I'm not going out there and listening to your fucking Marshall. And I had to tell Slash and Duff, I had to break the news because I was his monitor guy from the, the fake Guns N' Roses too. So when they decided to do this, they said, we want to start these rehearsals. Well, where's our side fills? And our, no, you guys got to use ear monitors. And for someone like Slash who just hated the concept of these things, but he got used to it, now he loves it. Because he realized that we're not taking away your sound, we're just doing like what you do in the studio. When he's in the studio, he listens on headphones, and they make great records, well it can be the same thing. It's just, but it took a couple of months to get his sound right. You know, we had to design these um, enclosures to put his amps in, but these things are like, the ones we ended up coming up with are like six feet by, because if they're too small, it made the guitar sound too compressed. So we had to come up with an enclosure that didn't have foam inside that we could mic and have it reproduce. And what we ended up doing was we set up, we did a session where we had a set of Marshall stacks in a room mic'd 57s and a set of Marshall stacks in these boxes that I would make out of plywood and I kept making different sizes 
And when he couldn't tell the difference, we would record him with Pro Tools. When he couldn't tell the difference between the one that was in the box, then we knew we had the size right. Then we had a road case built to that specific specification with the mic in the right spot. Because when you're miking guitars, back to a little bit of, you know, you've got, say, like you've got a guitar amp, you've got a speaker. There is a tremendous, if you put that mic in the center of the cone, you're gonna get one sound. Now, if you start moving that mic towards the outside of the speaker, it becomes a whole nother instrument. There's mic technique is everything. In fact, there's no right or wrong. It's all about experimenting. You'll see a lot of times, um, if you ever go to concerts, you'll see when they get the mic spot right, they take a little piece of tape and they put a little box on the, because they want to put it there every day. Because that one spot in the speaker has got... Well, here's the weird thing with guitars. There's no, a guitar is paper. There's no tweeters. It's a, it's a, it's a single, it's not bi -amped, it's a single range instrument, okay? Now, when you put that guitar through a PA system that's got tweeters, it's, it adds an unnatural sound that guitar players hate because guitar players are used to listening to paper. And I did this thing for this group, Motley Crue, where they were having a problem where th their guitar player was playing through like Ang. Angus plays through 25 marshals, they're all on. Mick Mars was playing through the same thing, like 25 marshals all on, even though only one's mic'd, he's listening to, you know, 20 stacks. Now, how does the singer compete with that? So they came up with this idea of having wedges, but not having, well, it was my idea, not having tweeters. So what we did is we had monitors, but they weren't real monitors. They only had speakers in it. And we did the same thing. We, we did like what we call a double blind. We, we had him play and face the other way and we kept A being and when I got the wedges sounding where he couldn't tell the difference, then we knew we had something. Now he was able to have his guitar coming at him instead of washing, not only the stage, but it would ruin the front of house. Like, just imagine that much sound that you don't have. Now, the reason ACDC gets away with it is because they only play in stadiums. So it's not that big a deal. But if they played in places like Kudos, is you know, you, you, you can't imagine the type of volume that's produced from a stage like that. It's, it's just, you know, but he's old school. He wants to feel it. Eddie Van Halen was like that too, you know, he, his amps. But you know, you're talking about guitar players that just, they take, whether you like the music, they take their instrument to a whole nother level. So when they touch that guitar through that amp, it's a sound that nobody else can, you know, like someone like Barbara Streisand, or I worked with this sing I worked with this English singer Annie Lennox, who to me was just phenomenal. And what she could do with the microphone and her voice and her technique was just, you know, it made my job easy. Like, even though Prince was a real pain in the ass, every sound that came off his stage was so perfect that it made it easy for me to reproduce. All I had to do was pick the right mic, set my high pass filter properly, make sure my monitors were tuned right, and I had enough monitors to produce the volume that I wanted, and all I had to do was turn it on. It was all about volume, because the sound that I was getting. But then I've worked for, then for example, I worked with Van Halen and David Lee Roth. He can't sing anymore, just because of his age or whatever. He's lost his voice. now. Didn't matter what I did, no matter how great I made that mic sound, when he sang onto it, it was shit. And he would sometimes stop. Sometimes he'd stop in the middle of the concert and go, hey, you think this sounds good? And I would just have to look at him and go, yeah. I mean, what are, you know, nothing I could do because what was coming out of his, but here's an example of, he knows the audience knows he sounds like shit. So he's trying to put it on the, but 
sometimes you just, it's, with certain bands, it's a no-win situation. And the, the key to being a good engineer is to sort of understand what you're capable of and what you're not capable of. Because sometimes, it's not so much in the studio. In the studio, anything's possible. It, it's all what's in your mind. It, it, you know, the, there's so many different ways to EQ and record and mic technique. But with live sound, sometimes it's you're never going to achieve that 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 sound that you that you want or or that mix that you want or the tones from that particular band. But understanding the limitations of what you can and can't do can help you get the best sound that you can get. Because a lot of times you'll get a really good mix, but if you try to go past that, then you'll really fuck it up and make it even worse. And I've seen it a hundred times. You know. I've got another question for you. Sure. Hearing loss. It's it's for me. I have my ears tested all the time. I make sure. You know, mixing front of house. I mean, hundred and five, hundred and ten decibels for a concert is is okay as long as you're not in close proximity. But say like if you're a you know, like you're a guitar player or someone that's listening to, like, you know, someone like uh, uh, Pete Towns of Lou has tinnitus. Um, a lot of guitar players have it, you know, because they, they're listening to their guitar so close. So yes, it's, but for sound engineers, not so much. Mm. You know, you just, but the other thing is, I don't know if you notice this in the studio, at, at high volume, after about 15 minutes, your eardrum starts to physically close. It physically gets smaller, mm -hmm. and you start to, sound starts, you start to hear less high end. If you ever go to a concert, and you notice that sort of the definition goes away as it, for a loud show. It's not the sound system, it's your ears. They physically close up. So you have about 20 minutes before your hearing starts to change. So when you're, a lot of times when, you know, you wonder why it takes so long, you see these bands that takes them a year or two to make a record, because Sometimes you know they go in the studio for hours, but they can really only listen for short periods of time, and they have to take long breaks because mm -hmm. you'll 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 notice that. I mean, with live sound, it's it's hard because especially with monitors, a lot of times I'll start a show, and everything will be going fine, and after about an hour, I'll have the singer complain, "Hey, it's not bright enough. Turn up the high ends because their ears are closing down." Mm -hmm. But as a front of house engineer, you have to be smart enough to. What I'll usually do is, I'll always make sure, I always like to have, when I'm setting up my PA system, I always like to make sure I have more volume than I need. I always want to have some place to go, okay? I never want to be driving my system at 100%. I find that 60, 70% is where I want to be driving it because, you know, is, is anyone drive a stick shift? You know, you know a manual car. Mm -hmm. There's a reason it has. You know, you're not you're not driving and it's it's pinning the RPMs at you know ten thousand all the time because it's just you always got to have somewhere to go with with sound and with dynamics too. Dynamics is very you know, especially with mixes. Dynamics is very important. That's the natural volume change that happens with music and un sort of understanding that. Um, what sort of metering do you typically use during concert, like spectrum well, analyzers? No. Like that? Basically, you know, every console has, you know, you, you take from the basics of a simple console where you've got the channel lights. Indicators. Okay. Never overload an input, ever. You never want to see the red light. Okay. When you're, when you're setting up your, well, when you're recording in the studio. Each track has its own metering, so you always want to make sure those meters, because if you record something that's overloading, you're never going to be able to get rid of that. But also when you're mixing live, it's, you guys have heard the term gain structure? Okay. Gain structure means everything from that input gain, through the channel strip, out the fader, into the processor, to the amplifier, out to the speaker. That could mean that could mean as simple as one or two controls or 
10 or 20 controls. Um, like, here's an example. I always tell people, never trim your amps back with live sound. Have your amps wide open to start. And when you're, when you're doing live sound and you're looking at your output meters, if, if your meters are clipping and you're not hearing the volume that you think you should have, something else is wrong beyond that. Maybe whatever processing isn't set right. Maybe your amps aren't wide open. For, for, or maybe you just don't have enough PA. But once you start clipping that console, it's like, it's like drive, trying to drive a car in first gear on the highway. It's only gonna go 30 miles an hour. It's never gonna go any faster, no matter what you do. Once you overload that channel, there's nothing you can do past that point. So it's sort of, I guess what I would take from that is, uh, if you skip, with engineering, if you skip any steps along the way, like this, sit, if someone once asked me, what's changed? What's changed from when I started doing sound to now? Well, the gears changed, but the job's exactly the same. If you skip any steps, mic placement, setting the input gain, setting the output, making sure my speaker system is pointing the right, if you skip any of those steps, it doesn't matter how great an engineer you are, or how great that band is, or how great you could have a Studer console and the best Neumann mics, and it's gonna be shit because you fucked up the input game. Or maybe you didn't, maybe you didn't make sure that your processor for your speaker system was set right, and now everything you did on the console is affected because your speaker system not set right. So a lot of times you'll see these guys, they just think that. We used to say, we'll fix it in the mix. Have you ever heard that? That's such bullshit. Because you, you can't. It's impossible. You have to do. That's the one thing about sound is everything affects everything. Every, like, if the mic clip is loose and the mic clip slips and you're in the front of the house, you don't see that. That fucks up everything. It's a simple thing. People are like, oh, that's, that's stupid. Why would you say that? That's stupid. But... I've seen it happen where, you know, you're out at the front of the house and I've seen, I've been assisting and the guy's like, hey, all of a sudden my snare drum sounds like shit. Okay, well, I'll call the stage and make sure that, and sure enough, the guy hit the freaking mic and it got pushed away. That simple. But if you didn't think of the simplest thing and just started turning knobs, you missed the simplest thing. You know, what's this, uh, there's a, a famous theory, you've heard it called Occam's razor. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know what that means? Yeah. Usually the simplest explanation is usually the right thing. That's so true because especially now, like we have, you know, when I started, there, was, there were two consoles out there. Now there's uh, DigiDesign, Digcos. <laughs> Studer's making a live console. SSL makes a live console. My, this, this, right? There's, I see a lot of engineers, they get lost in the equipment and they miss the big picture is what are we really trying to do? We're just trying to do good sound. I don't, I don't need 200 plugins. I've worked with engineers that have used so many plugins that they shut the DSP on the console down because they try to use Oh, I have the coolest fucking EQ and the cool, well, you don't really, yeah, it, it's fun to use all that stuff, but that stuff is more for the studio. But now with digital consoles, we're, we have access to plugins. Now I can have, I used to have to take the compressor I wanted, and that was a rack mounted, and take the reverb I wanted, and take the delay I wanted. Now I can have, like a rack of like, you know, 200 things, you know? See it. So what are the sample rates in the recording studio that you're working with? 96. And now with digital consoles, you know, that, that's a big thing. Like the, 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 the first consoles that came out weren't as good. Now, 
you get you get a lot of people that swear by I have to have this mic or I have to have this on that now I always stem back I had this one front worked with this one front house guy that swore oh I can hear this I said oh really okay how about this we're gonna do an experiment he had his well here's where here's where I got this idea from you too one of the biggest bands in the whole world I don't know if you guys know this, but almost every vocal on every U2 record, and you can look into this, was recorded with an SM58. And the reason is Bono had to hold the microphone to get the performance he wanted. And you cannot put your hands on a Neumann or any of those because you'll hear the vibration. So a lot of times in a studio, they would do what's called the guide track. Whereas the band would go in and do the initial tracks for the record. And the drummer would be playing the drums and there'd be a little booth and the bass player would be with his amp behind the booth. And the singer, to make the performance better, would be in the room with a mic, but they wouldn't use the vocal because it would have bleed from the other things. But they found that every time he tried to go back and record, because a lot of times vocalists record separately to get that pristine vocal sound but they're not in the same room with the band. Well, for him, he couldn't do it. And a lot of their big hit songs, like the song One was recorded with a 58. Most of their songs were recorded with a 58 because he wanted to hold that mic. So it just goes to show it's not the, you know, you can, it, yeah, the equipment is important if you don't have a good sound system and a decent mic free and, you know, decent cabling, and you know that's an example. Like if you're, you know, if your speakers are forty feet away from your amplifier, and you're using very thin cable, doesn't matter how great you, it's going to you're going to get so much impedance loss. It's you're you're fucked. But apart from those sort of theories, it, it's it's more in the person that's behind the console. You know, you can. You know, you can do great sound with very limited equipment. It's not all the equipment. It's having that imagination and just sort of understanding the capabilities of what it, what it can do. All right, any final question? Uh, uh, something not very technical, for, probably. Um, is there any site, place, company that you would recommend for someone who's not working professionally in the industry, but is doing like home stuff to start like a, a for what live sound or studio well any or both well for live sound the, the easiest thing is to not go to work for a company but to find the, a venue that you can start out like a club but the great thing about studio stuff is you can have a recording studio on your laptop now yeah what when i started out you had to have a two hundred thousand dollar console now anyone can have a record my son records at his, my house with garage band so, and there's a lot of artists that are tremendous because they recorded stuff at their house. So anybody, like, I recommend, you know, if you want to be a recording engineer, just start recording stuff. Mm -hmm. Find a band that can't afford to go into studio and offer to work for them because you'd be surprised at how many, how many records that have been recorded for no money that have sold millions of copies due to the fact that a lot of artists record their stuff themselves at home now. They don't need to spend a million dollars to, to go to the record plant in New York anymore. They can do just as good a job at home. You know, it's, it's crazy. I've got two last questions. Sure. So the first one is, you, you, you may answer just a simple. Um, with the automation and the advent of AI, um, do you see the job change, the job of a mix engineer, be it a live mix engineer? Or I don't team? use automation live. Uh, it's too dangerous. I want to keep the artistic value. What I use automation for live is not for moves, but for settings. Like, for example, for effects. If, if I want to have a specific reverb for a certain song, a different reverb, and I'll set that up in my snapshots so 
the, the right send and the right return level for that particular reorg, or if I if I have a ballad to a, a, a loud song, I'll use it for volume for very simple things and mutes, like I was talking about with the high pass filter. If a mic's not being used, I don't want it on in the PA. Like if, if I've got a hundred channels, but a one song there's no percussion, I want all those mics muted during that song because those are all bad frequencies bleeding into my speaker system. Same with studio. Like it used to be you'd have to use noise gates. You guys don't know what noise. Noise gates, you know, it shuts the mic off, but it's kind of dangerous because sometimes it cuts off some of the sounds. That's why we usually only use them on drums. But, you know, it's, again, it's a tool that you can, it's like anything. If you don't, sometimes if you don't know how to use it, it's best not to use it and just go back to the basics. You know, that's, I guess what, what I would say is if you're starting out in live sound, just start with the basics. You'll be amazed at the great, sound that you can get with just a microphone and a speaker and it's set up properly without EQing it and having the bet you don't need all that stuff you can just it's a lot of it's common sense like uh and if, if anyone's in a rush to leave I mean that's cool but I, I my son goes to school in northern beaches and they have the you know their room where they do all their performances and they were having a problem where it's constantly feeding back so the teacher said, hey, your dad's have him come look at it. Sure enough, it was two things. The speakers were way too low, and the speakers were behind the mic line. Okay? Whereas here's where the mic lines, now they didn't, like, like the speakers were here. They couldn't understand why it fed back for two years. And they thought, so here's what happened. They hired a company. They were going to spend twenty thousand dollars to replace the whole system. A company from from somewhere out here went and bid on a, a sound system, and the bill was twenty grand. And they were talking about it. And my son, who said, "Hey, you should call my dad." He didn't know about the money. He said, "Oh, they replaced." Just call my dad. He does sound. So I said, you guys don't need a new sound system. You need a couple of shelves built on the wall. They had beautiful Yamaha speakers. We spent uh, forty bucks on some plywood <laughs> and. We put the, we moved the speakers down, so now it's not, it's not, remember what I said, mics and speakers aren't, mic in front of a speaker, it's all bad, okay, that's why monitoring so hard. Problem solved. There's, they, now they, I have an idiot proof now, I put a little plaque up on the wall, when you're using a microphone, put the channel up here, I, I took a picture of a perfectly set up channel. Make sure the EQ's flat. Oh, and the other thing they didn't realize, yeah, and, the, and this one mic feeds back all the time. Somebody had gone to the channel and turned up the bass all the way. They never noticed it for two years. The bass was turned up. They couldn't understand why it was feeding back. But it's, it's a good example of like, sometimes the simplest thing is the logical thing. And I've seen a lot of times where engineers will run into these problems and then trying to fix the problem, they'll create 10 other problems because they they didn't realize it, it, it can be that simple sometimes. Maybe the amps turn down. So I always recommend like if you're, if you're having a problem, an audio problem, sometimes stop, walk away for five minutes and then go back and start. It's like a chain. Start from the beginning. Like when we're troubleshooting, do you guys have a few minutes? Yeah, sure. Troubleshooting a problem is is sometimes incredibly difficult. And it's 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 very important to have certain systems. Now here's an example. We didn't talk about uh, split it snake systems. You have a microphone, you have the mic, you have a mic cable. You plug it in somewhere on the stage. That might be a box that's now got a cable that runs to where the where the monitor board is. Now that plugs into another box. Now that box has a splitter and one feed goes to the front of house and one feed goes to the monitors. Now in that scenario, you've got, you've got the connector that plugs into the mic. You've got the connector that plugs into the stage box. You've got the connector that's in the stage box. You've got the connector that's at the end of the cable that plugs into the snake. Then you have the connector that plugs into each console. So now, 
I don't know if you ever heard you heard the term one-legged, right? Where a, a microphone doesn't sound right. It could be one of any one of those things. There's a very simple system that we created that still works. You have a microphone and a cable that you know works. You don't go to the microphone and work that way. You start at the source, which is the snake line. Let's say it's channel one you plug into. So the first thing you do is unplug everything that's past the snake. You plug into the snake line and you talk into it. Now, sometimes the monitor guy goes, I have it, but the front of house guy doesn't. Well, what does that tell you? The split to the front of house is bad. Now, if you started at the mic end, you'd never figure that out. Then now, let's say you plug in there and, and it works to both. Now you know it's on the other side of that. Now you work your way back and you go to the sub trunk. One, two. Oh, that works. And you work your way back. Now, sure, sometimes it's the mic cable, but if you start the other way, you might think it's the mic cable, but it might just be the splitter. So this, this very, you gotta develop these techniques for troubleshooting. And that's, you know, anyone who does live sound and who's ever had a problem, like with, you know, if you plug in a lot of mics and, you know, a tip, typical thing that happens, I don't know if you ever see this, you know how the numbers on the snakes are, it's very easy to get the six and the nine backwards. I don't know how many times I've, hey, I don't have channel six. Well, yeah, because you plugged it into channel nine because they, you know, they're so small and they're upside down. But yeah, that's, it's very important to, to sort of, get your systems of troubleshooting down because I've seen like, you know, you do a line check. You guys know what a line check is when you testing all your inputs. I've seen guys take, you know, 10, 15 minutes to check a hundred channels and two hours because they don't know how to trouble. They run into a problem and they don't know how to troubleshoot their issue. And that's something it's, it's, you don't really have to teach it. You just have to understand your equipment and sort of, again, sometimes it's the simplest thing. You know, a few times, you know, a lot of these snakes, they have big connectors. I've seen where, hey, that mic's one-legged, and the, the thing wasn't screwed on all the way. And we went through an hour because no one wanted to check that the, you know, the main, the main connector wasn't screwed on, or something that simple. Any other questions? All right, Dr. Let's thank uh, Vic for coming down today. And, uh, for, this, uh, and, um, for the visitors who have come here, and you've got any other questions about what we do at SAE and so on so forth, I'll have my name card on the table. Uh, please stay in touch with me. You can come and chat with me if you want to, chat, want to have a chat. If not, uh, have a good evening. Everybody, thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Can we hear one song? What's that? Can we hear one song? Sure. What you think about it? <laughs>